Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's funny. I mean, how many people here actually like to manage storage in Linux? <laughs> James, <laughs> Tron. Yeah. It's it's one of those things that I think is you know typically one of the more painful things. Um, but I do think there's good news to start with. So I always like to start with something positive, especially at the end of a long day. Um, you know, so again, I, I would claim that our storage stack is really world class, right? We have a lot of the features that you need to be leading in everything. Um, and we do span the, the gamut all the way from, you know, your Android phones up to supercomputers all use Linux IO stack, uh, Linux file systems to drive them. And we don't, that's, that's not a bad accomplishment. We support SSDs, new storage classes. We often come out with support for new devices among the first, if not the first, for most types of devices. And um, again, scale, scalable performance, IOPS and everything, we, we do pretty well in. So, you know, we have a lot of choices. Choice is good, usually. How many people here use XFS as their favorite file system? Two. EXT4, three. ButterFS, ZFS, some many, couple, yeah. So, RiserFS. Anybody use Riser? Yeah. yeah. I did use Riser and EMC Centera for five years, and we actually had really good experience with it. So I, I don't want to knock things, but um, but again, you know, that choice actually makes complexity, right? So the more choice we give our users, and not to mention the block the block stack itself has a lot of diversity in how you set it up, how you manage it. Network file systems, again, there's choice in protocols and choice in, in versions of a protocol. Um, this all makes it kind of mysterious to people. And, um, you know, with choice comes, comes the need to actually figure this out. Um, we do have, um, as a result of all this choice and all this power, we're really popular. A lot of startup companies are based around Linux. The Linux storage stack is under a lot of NAS appliances, all the way from little embedded things like an I believe iOmega is a Linux box to most of the uh, low-end things, all the way up to high-end appliances from a lot of enterprise storage companies. So what happens when you get out of our sweet spot, though? If you don't have that power user, the typical Linux sysadmin is somebody who has a lot of domain expertise in how to set up SAN networks, how to set up RAID groups, um, setting up uh, a, a RHEL, a Red Hat Enterprise Linux server, just the storage can be very complicated. But as we get more and more popular, and as you get into cloud and self-provisioning, all that choice and all that power leads to confusion. And we can't rely on people having been certified by one vendor or another. It's really, we need a lot more simplicity in our tools. I mean, how many people could actually get somebody using an Android phone to set up device mapper with de-encrypt and, you know, multi-storage uh, partition and maybe export it through NFS? I know, yeah, but that's that's the kind of usability you need. So James's point is, you know, you need to set you need to set a button for this kind of, uh, and it's not the power users, it's not the power use cases. But so I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the bad news, right? So our complexity. Number one, um, anybody here? I see LSI here. I, I've spent ten years at EMC, so I take a lot of blame for helping propagate lies and mistruths. Tron can take some share from NetApp. But if you talk to storage, we always lie to you. When you write a block, we don't put it where you ask us to put it or where we tell you to put it. We put it wherever we want. And it may or may not persist when we, when we, when we acknowledge a write. So if you're in the storage industry, we're often surprised that people expect us to actually tell them the, the truth, right? If you look at fragmentation in, inside file systems, it's a logical fragmentation. We might actually be physically contiguous. Um, if you look at SSDs, SSD devices, it takes that by an order of magnitude greater. I mean, every single block could be mapped to some other physical address. So again, um, you know, there's a lot of, of complexity in this as well. Um, we have logical software constructs like RAID or software or, or device mapper itself, which can do some of the, uh, for example, the DM thin target can remap all the blocks into random locations on top of your storage. So I would argue that we've made this really confusing for, for users. Um, the word target or initiator are kind of storage specific as opposed to server and client. Um, we don't use terms that most people are familiar with. In the file system space, we're not innocent either. Yeah, 
Yeah, if you, yeah, to your point. I mean, everybody has their own vocabulary, but we don't use common vocabulary. And, and file system people, uh, and I, I mainly am a file system developer, although I did spend a lot of time in storage business, our, our, our vocabulary is just as confusing. How many people here know what the barrier is in Linux? Right. Well, good, good, most of us. If you don't use the barrier option on your file systems, you will lose data, I can almost promise you. Right. So if you don't know it, we'll explain it to you at the end. Um, you know, and so again, you know, what this has led to with large enterprise customers is people have very domain specific knowledge. You'll typically have whole groups of people at a large financial service firm that does just storage. You have a second group that does just networking, maybe a third group that does provisioning of, of servers, standing of things like servers in a the cloud. They don't know how to do each other's job really very well. But as we get out of our, our traditional markets, you have people in the open cloud group who actually need to provision storage and they need to do just the basic things. So this is kind of my, my take on what we need to do to kind of help take our kind of very high powered Linux hacker hats off and take these powerful abstractions up the layer to make them easier to manage. And, you know, just a, a minor point, if it's, it's probably obvious to everybody in this room, but no matter what kind of fancy file system you use on the top of the cloud, whether it's HDFS or Gluster or Ceph or whatever, we actually do have hidden down there all that real complicated storage hardware in some flavor in all of our local file systems and our local storage stack. Hang on, James. I'm going to give you a mic so you can complain in person. Okay. You've got to give it a second. To yeah, it's on now. <laughs> it's on very low. Yeah. So the cloud is supposed to be all about hiding the nasty bits from the users. So all they see is their applications running into the cloud. So if we hide all of the crap that's going on under this in the cloud, that's going to be run by the same experts who have the domain-specific knowledge you've just said that we need to expand on the other slide. So we could move to a world where all of the experts do the cloud stuff, manage all of this super complex storage, and we never expose it except via S3 or something to the end users. You Wouldn't that be just as good? I think, uh, I would argue, and there's a comment in the back of the room. Yeah. You, you do hide a lot, but you don't hide the complexity from the people who have to run the clouds and manage the clouds themselves. So, so, so my answer is, you know, that, that storage-specific expertise isn't necessarily the same expertise that's gone into the people who have to run your cloud instances. That's my argument, at least, right? Maybe, and, and I think they actually don't need to do that. Typically, they're not configuring SANS or they're not configuring really complicated things. Somebody in the storage shop has done that, but the basic operations, people who want to, to provision storage, whether through, um, automation tools or whatever, the things that you use in the cloud space, will call down the, the chain to things that have to be more empowered to do the right stuff. So that's a good point, right? I mean, I think we agree on the, the goal. The goal is to hide it from people, but the goal is also to show the people in the cloud the same kind of power and functionality we have all the way down the stack, either in performance time, terms or scalability terms or robustness. Is that fair? Okay, so. Again, I, you know, to the point of the, the, the comment in the back, we try to hide this from people, not just in the cloud, but in consumer devices. Users think about, I need storage for my pictures. I need a, an instance for my enterprise database. I don't care how you all do it. Just, you know, give me something reliable and make it this big. Maybe give me snapshots and backups if they're really sophisticated. You know, they also want to know annoying things after a crash. You know, did you lose my data? You know. Did it all come back? And if you did lose something, can you please tell me exactly what went missing? Right. Those are kind of difficult questions, but that's kind of how users think. Usually we, in the storage business, we think about, oh, well, you, you know, it crashed and you lost sector 72,401. Right? And that's, that's not very meaningful to most people. The NSA could restore it for you. If they knew what sector 72,401 was, yeah. So we have to help the NSA do a better job. Yeah. I think, um, again, I come out of a kernel-focused background. I think, again, the, the way we develop things in the Linux kernel community is people have a lot of deep expertise in their specific component. I mean, if I want to ask James about, you know, ButterFS uh, allocation policies, 
not your sweet spot, right? The same thing if I ask the, uh, the Butterfest guys about SCSI or Trond about, I don't know, pick your least favorite part, device mapper, maybe. You know, you get, to, you get a lot of expertise in one area. People will polish a feature up, but we don't think end-to-end -end use cases. And again, those use cases are what we end up deploying, especially when we get to these less sophisticated uh, consumers of, of our storage stack. Okay. This is one of my favorite pictures that shows just why it's hard for people to actually visualize this. This picture was done by, there's a little attribution to the slides that I can't read, it's so tiny, but Werner Fischer and George Schoenberger. Um, some, these, these two people have put together this really complicated graph. And you can see everybody has expertise kind of in one of those boxes. But the end-to-end -end use case, how to configure all those components, how to get it to actually run well, is pretty difficult. Right? The ZFS guys have a slightly different, more converged stack in some area. But you still have a lot of complexity here. So that's a very long introduction to kind of why open source storage management is actually a fairly challenging, challenging area to work in. Um, to make it even worse, we actually tend to write storage management software in a bunch of different communities. People, anybody work on installers? Like Anaconda? Yeah. The Anaconda team, the, the YAS team from Suzy, the other, I don't know all the installers we have, they write storage installation code. People who want to run, maintain storage while it's running, they have a different set of, in, of routines they use. People who want to repair it, yet a different set. So we have different communities of developers who have their own utilities. They don't collaborate very much. Um, we tend to rewrite stuff from scratch. And when we take the opportunity to write everything about five to 10 times, we get the opportunity to write the same bugs, have the same errors, or maybe just have a diversity of different errors that you know, we could have collaborated on better. I, I also think, again, anybody here use GUIs? network management for the storage. But how many people prefer to use CLIs? Right? That's kind of the traditional user, you know, kind of power user approach. We all like CLIs, because you can do everything with a CLI, right? If you can read through the device mapper CLI and tell me how to do something. Yeah, so, so James is saying if you can get to the shell on your cell phone, how many can use their shell on their cell phone? A couple. Yeah. 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 So we're not the audience for this stuff in some ways, because most of the people in the room are fairly happy with, sta with, with the stack and the complexity and the power. But I would argue that even most of us would rather do things in an easier way. Um, and one of my arguments, again, to, to credit the ZFS community, you shouldn't have to use a different file system just because we made our tools so difficult to use. Right. So. It, So this is kind of, uh, again, I work at Red Hat. So this is roughly the, the uh, assemblage of things that you have to deal with if you're trying to manage a RHEL server in terms of storage over to something our, our KVM team, our virtualization team uses to manage setting up storage and, and virtual machines. Anaconda with its Blivet libraries, how you install RHEL boxes. The Blivet code is the, the code that does storage management specifically done by somebody in, in, in the installer team. Storage system manager, somebody in my team wrote this as a way to kind of emulate ease, to, ease of use of file systems layered on top of LVM or ButterFS directly. OpenLMI is a new project which uh, lets you do remote uh, SIM-based management, which will do some basic operations for storage network infrastructure. But they all call down to the kernel directly. They might call low-level tools, invoking them through the CLI, trying to parse the CLI output. Really bad way to actually manage stuff. Right? These things aren't really, they don't have programmatic APIs as they were originally designed. And then there's vendor-specific tools which exist out in their own entire universe. Right? They're not well integrated typically. So what have we been doing to fix this? So we, we have been thinking about this, and, and I've been complaining about it for a couple of years. I complained about this a couple of years ago in Prague. Um, Luke, Lucas uh, Churner, my team, had been doing some work on Storage System Manager, which is kind of inspired by the ButterFS ease of use. You know, if you want to add a device to a file system, you just add a device, right? I'll send some pointers to the project later. Um, at Linux Plumbers, was it last year, James? 2012, year before? Both years. We've tried to actually get 
the installer people, the runtime people, the kernel people to actually sit in the same room and talk about how to manage storage, um, how to actually collaborate on sharing code. And we have been investing as enterprise distributions and actually spending more dollars and more human resources and actually making things easier to manage. So I think we're doing the right things. So I'm going to share a little bit of what we're doing. And so one thing I think is really critical is going back to you know, hiding the, the complexity from people, figure out the top six to 10 things that everybody wants to do. Right? Those are the things we need to, to make really polished and really easy to do. When you fall off those common paths, I think it's perfectly reasonable to go back to your, your storage guru in the back room and have that person use the power tools. Right? But creating a file system, resizing a file system, migrating a file system to a new, a new set of uh, storage devices, that should be a fairly common and trivial task. We need to make sure that we have low-level libraries with C and, and Python bindings that people who want to build more sophisticated GUIs on top of our kernel stuff can consume. It's really bad to have people invoke command line interfaces, freeze the output, you know, the, the printf statements become an API. That's kind of the world we've lived in for a long time. That has to go away, right? People have to be able to use programmatic interfaces to program storage, probe storage configurations, and monitor for return codes. We also have a real lack of kind of a robust infrastructure for providing asynchronous alerts. Um, we've talked about this again at LSF, at the Linux Storage and File System Workshop, for a couple of years. Um, a good example, anybody know what thinly provisioned storage is? It's another lie, right? If, if your users all want a 100 terabyte file system, we'll give it to you, but we'll only put 50 terabytes in the actual physical storage, and we'll let you lazily grab real disk as you use it. Well, what happens when they take you up on the offer and you get to 40 terabytes of physical storage consumed? What happens in Linux? We, we, we send a message which gets logged on the console, I think. It gets logged in var log messages. We hope the sysadmin notices it by tail or something and says, oh, darn, I've, I've, I've run out of disk space. I should add more disk before the users all crash and die because it's not pretty if you run out of physical storage underneath virtually provisioned file systems. So we've talked about how to make these things programmatically um, meaningful and how to do it. The kernel people kind of uniformly thought it was best left up to user space, right? Have some kind of notification funnel up to user space. We, we don't really see the kernel as the right place to send email to assisted men or something like that. But that's work that hasn't really, I don't think it's really spun up yet. Okay. Subsume? Oh, uh, Ewan. Yeah. Yeah, so U events will be exported up to user space, which you can monitor for. But they haven't really been consumed in, in I think, in a productized way. Yeah. James says it's not his problem. Yeah, yeah which, which kind of goes back to that. Again, I think we also have to restructure multiple, some of these projects, and I'll talk a little bit about how we've done that. Because again, writing it five times or 10 times is inefficient. So I talked about this already. Um, just some example of projects here. There was a, a good coverage of this at Linux Weekly News. Anybody here not read LWN.net? Yeah, it's a great source resource. Um, they have on staff uh, people who come and cover all, all the kernel events. And they did really good coverage of LSF this past year. We talked about this in detail. So the Blivet library, I mentioned that before. This is something that came out of a, a Red Hat project where we've tried to yank out all the Python code that did storage-related management out of Anaconda, put it into a common place that people can consume and, and program against. We're also going to try, over time, to move more code out of things like Storage System Manager, which is also written in Python, move it into Blivet, and let Storage System Manager actually become the uh, effectively the CLI. Um, it's a very active project. It's something we've committed to delivering in time for RHEL 7, which is coming out with betas later this year and GA roughly next year sometime, middle of next year. That's all public information. Um, it's an active project, but we definitely need more documentation there. Lib storage management. Anybody use lib storage management? I know actually we've worked with a lot of our hardware partners. Um, NetApp has actually been one of the more active partners. I think LSI, other people have worked with us on this. The idea of lib storage management is to actually have a way that can 
give you standard interfaces to do these common storage tasks, probe your SAN topology, tell you what devices are there, all kinds of other things. It can actually stand up a, a NetApp filer for you. I think it can call the NetApp tools. It can invoke the proprietary tools running on your box in a standard way. So it'll give higher level administrative tools a way to do very common things, and even some complicated things. Depends how much power are in the tools, how much power is in the proprietary tools, and how much is supported by the standard storage um, administrative APIs. LibLVM is an attempt to bring that same kind of programmatic interface, Python and C bindings again, to Device Mapper and LVM devices. If anybody's ever tried to parse LVM, I mean, again, when you codify the output of CLI tools, you've basically codified the printfs in the C code, and people have to parse that. This is a way to get that more programmable. The project we've started up again. It was dormant for a while, but we hope to get this back, back up and running. Storage System Manager is, again, coded all in Python. It does basic operations that will run on top of ButterFS, C64, XFS, on top of LVM. Kind of the, the, the motivation of this project is to make it easy to consume storage in these ways. I think it's perfectly reasonable to try something with it and have it say, oh, that's not supported. You know, you have to go back if you go off the common path to, to the power tools underneath it. But it should make life easier for the common thing. Um, OpenLMI is one of the newer projects. It has both, um, it's basically meant to have a lightweight way to monitor setup and provision networking storage and some few basic things. So again, there's been some projects and some talks done at uh, various Linux Foundation events. There's, what do they call them, scriptlets, or something like that, where you can actually do little CLI-like ways to invoke these things as well. Overt is a project we use to manage things. The Overt team actually collaborated with the Gluster engineering team to actually put provisioning of uh, Red Hat storage in Gluster in the community edition of Overt, so you can stand up uh, Gluster clusters with an Overt uh, interface. So that's a nice graphical GUI example. And again, we're trying to get that stack refactored. So it looks kind of like this, right? And this is, again, Red Hat-centric. I apologize. But again, you still have your vendor-specific stuff. Everybody should be going through common code, right? Think of the top level as a presentation layer. And however you want to present it for your use case, whether it's this, the cloud or specific small virtualization or CLI, if we start consuming the same routines and debugging the same routines, and have them extract away all the, the very specific hardware, hardware and storage topologies, I think it'll be a more consumable thing. And it's not just a technical challenge. It's also a challenge in getting us to use the same terminology at each layer of the stack, and so that when users jump from one experience to the other, from installer time to runtime management, they don't have to relearn a different vocabulary. These are, you know, it's not a done deal. These are goals. But as you see these projects and hopefully take a look at them, or contribute code, it's good to, to try to keep those, those things in mind, right? Because we don't want to multiply the confusion by making things better in 10 different ways that are all unique and different and all need to be learned. Any questions about this stuff? Why wouldn't the LVM commands use the libLVM? They probably should eventually, but what I guess you, I, I could draw, these, these are just boxes on a slide. Um, so the, the truth is today, the LVM commands, device member commands totally exist and kind of have been around forever. LibLVM is a new piece of code that'll be a library that'll probably compile in the same code. So it's, it's a way of getting at the internal code without invoking the, the executable. So it, it'd be, I would hope it's gonna look kind of like um, the EXT, the E2FS progs libraries that you can link into your code. So think of it that way, right? So it's the library that gets you into the same code that the CLI has. But that's a good question. Any other questions here? So the other thing we have to do, and this is a little bit of a departure from just straight storage management, but kind of where we're going more broadly in the storage community, and, and some of these things have to do with management as well. So one of the things you'll see in, in kind of the competitive landscape with open source is VMware, Microsoft do an excellent job in manageability of their storage infrastructures. At least our, our customers 
hold them up as something to beat us up with, right? Um, storage management is one of the key jewels in, in a virtualized cluster. You don't like that, James? That's very true. Customers beat you up with something all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, the other thing that, that um, some of the people who non, in the non-open source world have been better at than Linux kernel people traditionally have been is participating in standards bodies to drive some of these manageability APIs like copy offload were driven by VMware and, and uh, Microsoft. I think NetApp was there and involved, but not really the Linux people as much as Yeah, we have a few people doing standards, but we don't. Yeah, well, the SCSI standards and the NFS standards so are different. So, so there are standards that get driven by the competition. A lot of it's about manageability, how to migrate data between LUNs, right? Usually the way that I find out about standards is not by having people going to participate actively in the standards, but through vendors who are partners who come back to me and ask, does this make any sense from a Linux point of view? I think we do need to step up and be more engaged because these things we need to actually manage as well. Um, we do have new work here. I'll talk about oh, the copy offload stuff. Anybody know copy offload? It's a great idea, right? Instead of pulling all the bytes when you want to copy a file or a range of blocks on a LUN, pull it back from the storage server to your, to your client and then push it back over again, that makes no sense. If the storage server is empowered, it can just say copy A to B or the range of A to the range of B. You don't move any blocks. It can be done instantaneously. You can do this now with NFS in 4.2, the spec. You can do it with uh, SCSI, at least two variations, right? Token copies and, and the extended copy. I think we've implemented both partially. I don't know what Martin ended up with. I think both are there. And you can do it with various file systems. Things like OCFS2 and ButterFS can do uh, ref links which can do effectively a file system implementation of a, a zero data movement copy. So we have actually, go ahead. So some before can do it with ButterFS. So the SMB3 protocol, right, a good point. Yeah, SMB3 is actually a really important protocol for us to support. We have SMB3 servers. That's the, the standard Microsoft protocol. Um, and if you look at VMware, it's actually promoted a whole set of storage management APIs that it uses to rely on for management and migration enablement. So again, we need to be able to, to expose those, to, to manage those, and allow, allow fancy GUIs into the common migration cases. Um, we talked about thinly provisioned alerts a little bit before. I think this is really important. Again, in a virtual machine world, in, in an instance where you're doing heavily over the provisioning, being able to get meaningful alerts back to people so they can act upon them is, is a, a really good thing to keep in mind. Um, and thinly provisioned storage is actually something that's been around forever in the enterprise storage world. Um, I don't know, Net, NetApp's done it for how many years, Trond? Forever? Right. 20 years. Yeah, I know EMC has done it, other vendors. We can now do it just in, in, with Device Mapper with the DM thin target. Um, you can do it with pretty much anything. So it's not an unusual feature. Um, it's actually fairly commonplace today. And as I mentioned, um, the, the protocols, the, the implementation specs actually define watermarks. We need to alert appropriately, let the storage administrator know about those in a timely fashion so that the admin can, can react. Copy offload. This has made progress even this week, I think. I think uh, Zach Brown, who'll be here for Plumbers, um, has been driving a new implementation of a new variation of the uh, splice system call. He gave up driving a new system call, at least temporarily, although I saw some churn this week. Um, but splice will allow us to do that copy offload, and in the kernel, we'll figure out what the target is, whether it's a SCSI backend or an NFS backend or a local file system. Um, it should be. Um, progress after three, four years of debate. Hopefully we'll actually have something in shipping, shipping upstream kernels. ButterFS, uh, I think ButterFS is something that actually in the, the native Linux space made a brave attempt to make it easier to manage storage. Um, it's getting a lot more robust. We had a talk from, uh, from the, the, the SLAS, from 
uh, about the state of ButterFS and their product. I think ButterFS has been hitting that point where they've been investing most recently in getting stability into the code more than features, which is, is welcome. I hope we get it in a robust, full-featured with RAID and everything working soon. And you'll see it more broadly supported in a full-featured way. Um, last time we asked Chris Mason and Joseph Bassake, I think it was at LSF, Joseph gave a, a stand-in State of Butterfest talk in April, May, where he promised it would be 100% solid by the end of 2013, which is, gives him a few months left. Yeah, but, but some of the things I'm looking for in ButterFS, as somebody who has to look at how we, how we treat it in, in RHEL, are can you run out of, when you're running out of DRAM and low memory pressure and you're running out of disk space and, you know, if you hit an I.O. error, can you recover? Can you drop power and, and get your file system back? Are the user space tools robust and fully supported? And Chris, Chris still owes us a 1.0 release of the ButterFS uh, user space utilities, which has been promised for a few, few months now. So hopefully that's all going to come together in the next few weeks to months. And we'll have a boring, reliable file system as opposed to a really exciting one. NFS features. Um, some of the things that actually NFS has, has come a long way in the past couple of years. Um, anybody know about labeled NFS? It's good you know about it, Shrond. <laughs> yeah. So, one thing that, in, I remember uh, Matthew Garrett was talking about SE Linux and Secure Vert and so on, how to, how to um, harden your, your OpenStack instances. Again, this is more complexity, but what we can do now is we can pack, pass security attribute labels over the NFS protocol. That was part of 4.2 as well, the ITF standard. And we've implemented both on the server side in the upstream kernel and on the client side. I don't know if any vendors have implemented it in their arrays, but hopefully it will come in the next few years. Oh, the standards, we were a bit aggressive, Tron says. We were a little aggressive. Yeah, it's not, the ink's not dry. No one signed it. But yeah, some, some evil distribution wanted it. Yeah, but um, it is there. So in an all Linux environment, you could actually stand up secure Linux guests and clients uh, with S with today, which is kind of cool. And I do, I do expect it will be ratified and it'll get into production servers. I, I can't tell when, but I don't think it'll be forever. It's not that, it's not that much of a big deal, I think. If Tron could do it. As I mentioned before, one of the evil vendor tricks is to standardize something you've already shipped, and then other people copy you quickly. So maybe, we'll, maybe we're learning, right? Um, a lot of work has started to fill in kind of the, the few extra bits of the NFS 4.2 protocol. Um, that's actually, I don't know, Tron, do you want to talk anything about that? I mean, it's kind of um, early, early days. Right. That might be yeah, so as I just said, you know, the, the standard isn't quite done yet, but um, we've already started on the, on the implementations because a lot of them are just um, POSIX features like, you know, F allocate. Hole, punch, uh, hole punching isn't quite POSIX, but it's you know there are, there are, there are standards for it, um, and the the spec is very very unlikely to change um, uh, un, until the final publication. Uh, copy offload, um, you know, is as as you said, you know, being being driven on on many levels. Right. Um, we have running code, um, but there's still some details that need to be fixed in the, in the uh, protocol um, and that we're, we're waiting for. Again, I, I don't think that's going to be sort of a, a big delay. How long did 4.1 take uh, to, to get drafted? 4.1 took us about uh, 10 years end to end. Yeah, so, so the jump from 4.0 to 4.1 was 10 years. We hope to go from 4.1 to 4.2 in like a year and a half or so. Right, we're trying to get an order of magnitude faster. So, so no promises, but we're optimistic. Um, so that, that was roughly what I had today, but I'm happy to take questions about this or other file and storage questions. And all that stands between you all and dinner and drinks or whatever. The drinks are the important part, James says. Questions? A hand here. I'm leave this guy on. 
So did I hear you say that you want the kernel to send mail to your management program? No, no, I, I said we don't want the kernel to send mail. So when we were debating, it was funny, we were debating with mostly a kernel audience about who should take care of all these asynchronous events and what to do with it. And the kernel people felt routinely it was somebody else's problem. If we just had a re reliable mechanism to communicate out to some user space agent, it's much better to do you know, the proper actions based on notifications. Let some daemon or something up in user space send an email or poke somebody or flash a red light, but the kernel shouldn't really be in that, in that business. Oh, right. Uh, um, so you say the kernel should not notify user space about... It, no, it has, to not oh, okay. it has to have a notification mechanism, and that has to be reliable, and somebody who subscribes to it should interpret it and do the appropriate user, user land thing. Right. So the improved question is, did I hear you say that the kernel should send something to <laughs> user space? It, I think, James, it does as of 3.12, right? The patch is in there. So what it does is, you know the current uEvent mechanism that uDev listens for. Um, we will send a uDev event for certain um, uh, unit attention code, some of which are the thinly provisioned ones. So if you configure UDEV or something else to listen for them, they can perform almost any action you want based on that. So you can add a script to UDEV that will send the email that you're looking for. Another question in the back there? Yeah. I'll run. This is a good exercise. Um, so this, we've had disks that can support um, thin provisioning for some time. Um, is there any timeline for when we might get file systems that will support sending down trim or um, write same or unmap commands by default? ext4 has marked this experimental for probably five years. Well, now. not not experimental. So, so the w what we've done, and, and again, making. So the question was about um, when will file systems actually send down the, the the we call it discard at the file system level, and it maps into trim for S SSDs that do ATA commands, and it write same with unmap or unmap commands for SCSI devices, and who knows for weird PCI Express cards what it's called, either. Dataset management. Dataset management command. So, so we, we mux out into the right command. Right, so we also have the, nothing is experimental Yeah, so it's all, but, but it's, a, it's a good question. So the reason we left it off is we bricked a ton of devices when we turned it on, right? So, and the other reason was, um, and, and mostly, on, to be honest, these were early consumer versions of SSD devices. Um, but for enterprise storage, enterprise SSDs, and so on, it's probably less of an issue. But the other way to do this is not the, the what I would call in-band discard management, which is with the mount option, which every time you delete a file, you send down little potentially 4K discards. But you could also do FS trim, which will lock a whole range of a file system and resync the device. Um, I, I will add that um, there's also a, a problem in the uh, ATA protocol, the T13 protocol, where the, the trim command is unqueued, which means we have to drain the queue. You have a huge performance hit for ATA devices. I believe they've fixed it or are in the process of fixing it. Yeah. So t as of today, for, for ATA devices, which is your SATA devices in consumer laptops and desktops, that's not in shipping in product or, or ratified in spec. Yeah. So James says the ATA people are catching up with SCSI. Yeah. Okay, so, um, but, but that's a good question. I mean, you could turn it on, but you, the reason we turned it off and I, I will add, we should have turned it off more completely than we did, as opposed to leaving it on more regularly, because we do discard everything when you make a file system routinely, and we've had nothing but pain from that. The number of even high-end devices that have hung or never returned or whatever has been way too common. Yeah. 
I think it, I think it really, so we actually have support for the discard operation all the way from vert guest all the way through the QMU stack all the way down in many, if not all cases, if we're, or at least we're trying to make that complete. Vert IO SCSI. We try to do it even on file where you map the discard into a hole punch. That's where you deallocate blocks in the middle of the file, which will turn back into magically SCSI or ATA commands underneath that if and when that all works. No, they, okay, so, so the question is, how would a disk actually implement? Disk advertise capabilities that are compliant with the spec. We believe them, we issue the commands, and they die sometimes, right? Because enterprise storage people do a really good job of testing it. Some of the consumer grade devices, specifically that we see in Linux frequently, don't do as well. <laughs> yeah. If he was using... No, no, the kernel is delayed because he's off Yeah, yeah. But, but it's just like we don't have a bit in the kernel that says we have no kernel bugs either, right? So just to be fair, yeah. Another question? Yeah, so I'll just add one more note. We actually have a couple of things later in the week um, that we're going to be talking about um, that I didn't mention in the slides here that are just interesting kind of generically. Um, there's a new class of drives called shingled drives, um, and we have um, some of the storage vendors coming to pitch what is hopefully a converged proposal from different warring uh, vendors on how to, uh, what they want Linux to implement. And shingled drives are kind of neat in that they look almost like a tape to us, in that they're, they have effectively very large writes of append-only bounds, and you can't do random I.O. to them, or you get much less density and less performance. So that's at one end of the spectrum really giant capacities, really slow IOPS. And the other end, we're going to be talking about persistent memory technologies, which are DRAM class parts, which might drive 5 million IOs per second. They're anything but slow and random, but they have much different capacity points. And the, the problem there is we, we're a little bit slow. We're a little short of 5 million IOs per second per target, I think, in the kernel today, by maybe an order of magnitude, James. Can we do, can you do a million? I think we Yeah, so we have a lot of work to do either way. And um, when these devices become commodity, and they, they will come become commodity, um, we'll need to have some new ways of getting our existing stack to run really fast, and we'll probably have whole new generations of file systems that might be specifically tailored to them. So more bugs, another five years of waiting. Just squeeze them together. Yes, that's cheating. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Turn off the direct IO and let it just coalesce everything. Yeah. So, any last questions, or shall I let you all escape off to uh, dinner and beer, drinks? Okay. Well, thank you very much.